Hey everybody, Jeff from Corrugated Cavalier here, coming at you with another video. This time it's not really so much about uh, technique and, um, you know, myself doing swordsmanship or interpretations, because I've been doing peasant's work all week, getting my garden ready for spring. I'm going to try to grow some vegetables uh, this year, so we'll see how that goes. Um, anyhow, this video is about... Uh, something that has started to come up in some of my other videos comparing Italian and German techniques, uh, specifically Fiore and Lichtenauer in this case. And it's kind of something that I've always wondered about since I started getting into Kima anyways. So I just want to make it very clear throughout this entire video, this is just stuff that I'm kind of wondering about, and uh, I think, you know, I have a little bit of a case for, but I, I really have no proof of this. Um, and of, of any of this stuff really and we, we probably never will to be perfectly honest it's just kind of a, a feeling that i have and really i want to start a discussion about it and see what you guys think and uh, if you have any sources or opinions on this subject as well so basically uh, my opinion is that um although lichtenauer and fury are clearly not the same system um i think that they do share some things in common and it makes to me it makes sense because the medieval world at that time, in the 14th century, in the beginning of the 15th century, was pretty well connected, really. Um, especially uh, larger town centers, etc., etc. And there was a lot of cultural exchange. There's cultural exchange in art, in fashion, in music, which I am going to talk about a little bit. Um, and it just makes sense to me that there would be some cultural exchange in martial arts as well. Um, I'm going to get to the martial side of it, but I'm going to start with the comparison with music to just kind of give an example of how this uh, can transpire in other arts. Um, so, in the 14th century, Italian composers, uh, there was a style, well, it was more of an era, I guess, called the Trecento. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as Ars Nova as well. Um, and they're they were coming up with some more musical forms. It was becoming a little bit less constrained by older medieval rules of music, like uh, plain chant, etc. So uh, one of these forms was called balata or balate in the plural form, and that really has a lot of characteristics similar to the French virilai, especially the poetic form. And uh, if you know about music, you know that the music has to follow the lyrics. So the music has to, to some degree, follow the poetic form as well. Um, so uh, the French had the virelai, and Guillaume de Michaud was one of the most well-known composers of virelai from France. He lived from 1300 to 1377. And uh, for Balate, which was somewhat based off of French virelai, um, Francesco Landini was one of is one of the most well known composers of Balate. Interesting fact: he was blind, I think, from birth. Um, he was born in 1325 and lived until 1397. He wrote a bunch of Balate. He wrote all kinds of other stuff too, though, um, and he also actually did uh, write at least one virelai on record. There's a manuscript that survives, just like the Rahima manuscripts, and is a pretty great resource. Um, he also, uh, well, perhaps not he, other people wrote uh, Saltarello was a popular form of music from Italy. It was popular in courts across Europe, actually. Uh, I performed one up here. If you want to check one of them out, you can also just search YouTube for others. Um, and the Saltarello was, uh, was, it was a dance form. And the terminology has something to do with like a leaping step, basically. And this uh, influenced or gave birth to similar dances in Germany, such as the Quadrinaria and Hoppertons. There were also forms that were very similar in France and Spain as well. So that's just one small way that there's this kind of cross-pollination of ideas. And that's in music, so it's, it's not martial culture, but it's still a form of art and it's still a form of culture. Uh, at really specifically kind of the time that we're looking at, like, uh, you know, mid to late 14th century. And, you know, this stuff goes into the 15th century as well. It's not just 14th century. So enough on the musical side of things. I know you guys are here for swords, probably. Um, so um, 
Fiore himself, I'm going to start with Fiore, in his manual uh, says that he learned from Italian and German masters at great personal cost and expense to himself. Um, so he, he traveled around and on his own expense to learn this stuff. And he actually gives a list of some of his students as well. Um, and there are two Germans on the list, Piero del Verde and Niccolo Vorisellino. Don't really sound like German names, uh, but, you know, there was, once again, a lot of, uh, you know, boundaries weren't always so strict at that time. They were shifting, etc., etc. He also goes on to mention others. I assume that the rest of these could be considered Italian because he doesn't make any claim otherwise. Galeazzo de Capitani, Capitani da Grimello, Lancilotto de Bacharia da Pavia, Giovannino da Babo from Milan, and Sir Acco da Castel Barcio. So he lists his some of his students specifically. Presumably he had more, but these are just some that he felt like mentioning, and all of them performed knightly deeds at at the lists in some kind of sounds of duel or tournament format. Um, so clearly Fiore traveled around learning from different masters, and uh, so did Lichtenauer. Uh, I don't know the Lichtenauer the Zettel very well yet. Um, I haven't seen where he talks about going to other countries and learning, but Paul Hausbuch, who was possibly writing while Lichtenauer was alive, says that uh, he traveled and searched many countries um, in, in study of this art. So, uh, you know, we have both of these guys traveling around to gather information on this art and compile it into their own system. Um, and you know, there are little similarities, like if you take Schrankut, means barrier, guard, I think, and uh, Porta di Ferro is iron door, barrier, iron door, fairly similar things and fairly similar guards. Um, also later on in the Bolognese tradition, you get a lot of guards that take names from Fiores as well. And to me, it's it seems more likely that these guards were just kind of like out there sort of in the air, as I'm, as I'm saying, uh, rather than like everybody learned from Fiore's manual. That's a possibility for sure, but it seems more likely to me that this is stuff that Fiore found and put in his book, but other people probably knew about at least some of it as well. I'm sure Fiore has his secret techniques and whatnot that are, are his alone, but uh, some of the guards seem like that's, it, it seems at least likely to me that they were out there otherwise as well. Um, and if you take a purely geographical look, so Fiore uh, was from Friuli, which is in uh, Udine province, and I did a little work on Google Maps, and actually there was a thread on my armory that I started uh, about this a while back, and I'll put that link below. And uh, it's, it's like around 250 miles between Udina and Munich, Germany. And if you're walking, just straight up walking, and you're doing about 25 miles per eight hours, that would take you about 10 days to two weeks, like purely on foot. If you're on horseback, and it's just you and a couple of other companions on horseback, not attached to a wagon train or something like that, you can make that journey in about a week to maybe nine or 10 days. That's just uh, doing some rough calculation I looked up like what's reasonable on a horse without pressing it too hard and stuff like that so these places are even by medieval standards I mean yeah a week is a pretty long time to travel on horseback but uh, you know you might be visiting for another reason or somebody might be coming to you who knows um, it's still not that far really um, people were willing to travel far and wide for knowledge and and other things resources etc etc um, so, I hope that that was somewhat thought-provoking. It was a little bit longer than I intended, but uh, feel free to comment below. Uh, what, what do you think on this subject? Uh, like I said, these are just some things that I'm wondering and kind of my thoughts. So, uh, yeah, let's feel free to start a discussion. Maybe people know about some sources that I don't and can uh, shed some extra light. Cool. Thank you guys all for coming by the channel once again. I really appreciate it. We just hit 100 subscribers. We'll have a good 100 subscribers video coming up soon. Please like, subscribe if you have not, share this around to people. You can chat with me uh, on Twitter, at CorrugatedCava1. And yeah, be good to each other. Ciao.